Good morning. I'm Susan Meredith. This is the morning edition. And if you've been watching the ads on uh, late television last night, you know that I have a very special guest and a special two-hour show today. Ron Wyatt is a man who believes he has discovered the ark and various other uh, scriptural artifacts and uh, some of the major things in the Bible, the major events. Um, he believes that he is the one person who was designated to discover these things. And uh, are you skeptical? Do you believe? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the Bible? Do you know the stories? Well, he's going to tell us something about those things here today. My guest for this special two-hour morning edition is Ron Wyatt. And uh, Ron is the man that uh, believes that he has discovered Noah's Ark, uh, the bones of the giants that we're going to talk about later, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the pyramid building machine, the Red Sea crossing site, uh, the real Mount Sinai, the crucifixion site, and the Ark of the Covenant itself. Uh, the Ark, of course, being different than Noah's Ark, which is uh, what most people think of you as having discovered. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people believe that, including Turkey. Is that right? That's uh, correct. The Turkish government? Yes. I uh, appreciate your invitation to come spend some time with you, Susan. Oh, well, that's exciting for me. I met you a long time ago, eight years ago. Yes. And um, I had the most fascinating time just sitting and listening and, and looking at your films. And how did this all begin? I guess uh, probably when I was about 15, somebody gave me a book. Uh, it was called God's Graves and Scholars, written by Saram. And it had to do with the excavation of Ur of the Chaldees, which, of course, is the city that Abraham migrated from when he went into Canaan. And I just became fascinated with archaeology and ancient history. And so I've been reading everything I could get my hands on uh, ever since that had to do with archaeology and ancient history. And... Then in 1977, I started making field trips to try to locate some of these things and document them. Okay. We're going to uh, get into the art just a little bit right now because I want to get into some of these other things first. Okay. And we'll, we'll kind of uh, get to Noah's Ark later. I, I want to show you first. Uh, Ron has been on many television shows. He has uh, written a book called Discovered, Noah's Ark. And... Um, uh, when did you actually see it the first time? Uh, let's see, it was August 26, 1977. 1977. Yes. Did it look like an ark to you then? Well, it looked like a boat. Uh, a lot of people nowadays, due to our changing lifestyle, haven't seen a boat. Uh, but when I was a kid, they were fairly common. Mm -hmm. uh, people did a lot of fishing and... Uh, so anyway, a lot of times after a storm, uh, when the river would come up and all, these boats were tied off to trees and whatnot so they wouldn't get swept down the river in the flood, uh, the little local flood, mm -hmm. and, but they would fill with water. And so when you saw these boats, they would just be the upper edge of the gun walls or the mm -hmm. hull uh, protruding above the water. And so out in eastern Turkey at 6,300 feet up on this mountain uh, sat this uh, boat that just the upper edge of the hull was sticking above the dirt. Okay. And, of course, a big bulge in the middle that showed there's a little more to it than there would be to a simple rowboat. Okay, you had a lot of people refute that uh, that idea of yours that that was a boat up there on the mountain for a while. And well, uh, Susan, there was... a a very talented artist uh, that painted a barge-shaped uh, structure into a photograph of Mount Ararat. And uh, the whole idea of a barge shape uh, got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. There was a movie in search of Noah's Ark, and in there they had a model and they built a, a barge-shaped object and then they put a little barge-shaped uh, stick in a wave tank to show the stability. Now, 
I'm a, a critical individual, skeptical, mm -hmm. and I hope your audience is. I'm sure many of them are. And I'll say right up front, if somebody told me they had found all this stuff, I wouldn't believe it for a second. Okay. And so uh, what we have done is documented all of it very carefully uh, so that people can see it for themselves. And anyway, in this uh, movie, they s supposedly demonstrated the stability of a barge shape in a rough sea. Mm -hmm. uh, the, they edited <coughs> this thing. And you could tell within seconds it had turned over and gotten entirely wet. And so they showed two uh, segments, fractions of seconds. And in the second one, it was wet. It had not uh, been as stable as they would like us okay. to believe. So anyway, a barge shape in a rough sea where there's torque. Uh, it will not survive. Okay. The oil companies attempted to use barges to transfer oil from one place to the other, and it just did not work. Okay. So they are not as stable as the story uh, implied back in those days. Now we're going to show a clip here in a minute, and uh, right now this I know this comes in three sections. Can you get a picture of the uh, the model that's in front of us? This is actually two scale. It isn't that's a right. scale model, but it is two scale. And uh, this is what, by all accounts, uh, evidently everybody who knows anything about the ark believes it looks looked like this. That's right. Those that are familiar with our research. See, uh, in archaeological investigation, for example, we can measure the depth of what's left out there from end to end, and you can tell where the upper decks began and ended. Mm -hmm. Now, due to erosion over the 4,700 years since it came to ground up there, uh, we're, you can't be precise, but you can be very close. Okay. And so this gives us the fact that it had three decks or three uh, uh, t floors, mm -hmm. and uh, then from side to side uh, you get the same picture. Okay. And so we know that this is the shape and the inside, which we'll show, I guess, a little later, uh, is based on subsurface radar scan, mm -hmm. which gives you the ability to look through the earth just like a doctor does through a fluoroscope mm -hmm. to see our broken bones if we should need his assistance in that mm -hmm. area. So it's reconstructed from what the uh, data shows the boat to have looked like. Okay, now this is not the way you saw it, though, and we want to show you the way he did see it. Uh, here is a video clip right now, and we'll show you what Ron saw on the mountain. On June 20th, 1987, after 10 years of intense research, the Turkish government announced to the world the discovery of Noah's Ark and the dedication of it and the surrounding area as a national park. In 1977, Ron Wyatt made his first trip to this area after seeing this satellite photo in Life magazine. It was during this first trip that Ron found numerous huge drogue-style anchor stones, all the same approximate size as the one here. These were all in a direct alignment with the boat-shaped object, evidencing their being cut loose or dropped as the ark entered the area of its final rest. These all bear ancient iconographic inscriptions of the eight survivors of the flood. In December of 1978, an earthquake in this highly remote area dropped the soil from around the formation, allowing Ron to see for the first time the rib timbers and deck support timbers visibly exposed on the sides. A large crack was also formed along the entire length of the object, and he was able to measure the depth and take samples for analysis. The analyses showed a very high organic carbon content consistent with ancient wood. Later metal detection surveys and subsurface interface radar showed an incredible man-made structure encapsulated within the formation keels and keelsons, bulkheads, decks, 
and even partitions between the cages became visible through these scientific devices. The Turkish government has completed a beautiful visitor center just above the Ark so that visitors of every faith from all nations can visit and see the Ark for themselves. Goodness. Goodness, they, it must be, that's quite, quite a rough terrain out there, though. Where do people stay when they go out there to look at that thing? Uh, there are several hotels not too far uh, from the boat, and uh, they certainly don't come near our standards of motels and hotels mm -hmm. here in the States. Uh, the water doesn't work usually in all of this, but there are some hotels around. Okay. Uh, I call them no star hotels. No star, <laughs> but it beats uh, camping out. <laughs> well, I guess the uh, Israelites they, they didn't have hotels at all. I guess they were less than no stars out there. <laughs> uh, tell me, they, there was a crack that went down the center of the boat, and it said right. that you knew then the depth of it. And uh, did the depth meet up with what was in the Bible? Uh, well, uh, when a boat uh, goes through what Noah's Ark did. First of all, the sides fall out. Mm -hmm. This is called splaying. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of boat burials and things, uh, say in England, for example, the Sutton Hoe boat. And so the boat just spreads out like this. The top comes down. And so while the original arc was 51 and a half feet from bottom to top, this is about 28 feet at this mm -hmm. point in time. So. But we have found uh, remnants of all three decks uh, on the boat. And uh, what we have done in some cases here is assume, excuse me, that uh, there was some symmetrical relationships uh, in these decks, like mm -hmm. the stalls. We find them in the back, and we find them in the front. And uh, so, based on this, we have constructed uh, a model. Uh, and there's not this much, uh, shall we say? this much of the boat is not out there in this condition. Okay. It's bare, but it's kind of fallen in and compressed. How long is it? I mean, in the Bible now, it, it talks about how long it is, but it's based on what? The cubit? Right. It says 300 cubits. Mm -hmm. Now, How long is the cubit? I mean, uh, The cubit that Moses was talking about when he wrote the book of Genesis is the royal Egyptian cubit, mm -hmm. 20.6 inches. Okay. And that is the cubit that was used when he constructed the Ark of the Covenant and the other furnishings for the tabernacle okay. uh, of the congregation. So uh, in uh, one of the prophecies, it talks about the cubit of the sanctuary uh, being a different one than the normal Israeli cubit of that time. Okay, and how long then was what you found? Well, 515 feet. Which would be absolutely right. Exactly right, Exactly yes. right, uh -huh. okay. And it's quite a bit wider. I think it said in the Bible uh, by those cubits, uh, it was like 85 feet wide. 87, should have been. Uh -huh. right. Okay, but it's how wide? It's fallen out, and it's about 128 to 38 feet okay. uh, along the mid portion. Now, the front end got uh, covered uh, with lava and then a mud flow before it had time to splay a great deal. So that is quite well preserved out there, and this is what we hope to excavate first when we get started excavating. Okay, and it's all petrified, isn't it? That must be real expensive to try to get out there and dig through. It's uh, You have to work with these things carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, if... Uh, your audience would like to read something that is similar to this if they would uh, go to the library and get a book on the Sutton Hoe, S-U-T-T-O-N, and then H-O, uh, funeral boat. Uh, the r remains of the ark are a great deal similar to that. And when you excavate these things, a lot of times... Uh, you can't just dig a trench across it like uh, you do a normal uh, tell or a normal archaeological site uh, because this this is much more fragile than, say, for example, stone buildings. Uh, 
that are associated with civilizations in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. How uh, long has it been sitting out there? Um, About 4,700 years. Okay, that doesn't make the Earth really very old, then, does it? If we no. Uh, there's a lot of indicators that the uh, Earth is not... Uh, shall we say, man's existence on the existence on the planet has not been nearly as long as some of these mm -hmm. folks would like us to believe. Something short of what, six thousand years? That's correct. Okay. Yes, and then of course, the flood obliterated all pre-flood geology and rearranged it. So what we're looking at is uh, approximately forty-seven hundred years and the amount of alluvial soil or erosion that is present on the planet at the uh, ends of rivers where they go into the seas and all of that mm -hmm. show that that is a very accurate uh, amount of time or uh, approximation of the time since the flood. Okay, we know that eight people survived on the ark. How many died? How many were on, how, how populated was the earth? Uh, there's. Uh, you can project the population uh, by the age of the people. You know, it says uh, Adam lived 939 years, and, and it talks about the other people. They all lived in excess, with maybe one exception, uh, of 900 years. And it says, and they begat sons and daughters. So a projected population would be very close to the 5 billion that we have today. Five billion. Yes. That died, that didn't believe. Right. And Noah was the one that did. I noticed on the um, uh, the stones, the anchor stones, uh, there were crosses on there. How did they get right. on there? Uh, okay, that is a question I get asked quite a bit because, of course, most people are aware that the cross was not a popular symbol until after the crucifixion. No, and Noah and didn't put them on there. Noah did not put these crosses on there and we have found several of these anchor stones that have been buried in the mud flow near the ark mm -hmm. and they do not have the crosses. These are Byzantine style crosses and Crusader mm -hmm. style crosses so they were put on there from the fourth century until about the eleventh century. Uh, there was a large wall, Susan, that uh, somebody way back in antiquity put through this village that Noah founded after he uh, got off the boat and his wife told him you're going to sleep on the couch until you get me a house away from this boat. I don't want to see this boat ever again. <laughs> you know, this sort of thing. <laughs> Only took him 120 years to drive her crazy with it, I guess. Right. And then the year on there with all the animals, I imagine that everybody was a little tired of the ark by that time. But anyway, they built this large uh, clay wall, and they put tile with pictures showing the uh, story of the flood on there, and remnants of that are still out there today. And so when these early Christians arrived, that was there for them to see, and they were convinced that these were relics from Noah's Ark, so they put this iconographic a uh, set of crosses on there representing eight people and the importance of the people in relation to each other. Right. And so we have that today showing that those folks were convinced. Okay. Hold that thought. We are going to be back. It's the hour of 8 o'clock, and this is a special morning edition. If you've just joined us, uh, it's going to be two hours long instead of a regular hour. And my guest today is a man who has discovered what now is believed even by the Turkish govern government over in uh, uh, near Mount Ararat is the Ark. And um, we uh, have a, a little model here of it that Ron Wyatt brought. Um, he has been called the Indiana Jones of uh, modern day. And what do you think about that, Ron? Well, uh, we have had some adventures uh, some of them have been rather dangerous and spooky, but I don't really think about myself at all. I, I'm, shall we say, just thrilled to death to be working with these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, you know, I've been called some other things too <laughs> that were uh, a bit less flattering by some folks. Uh, when it comes to Noah's Ark, there was some. Uh, 
stories went around, you know, about folks seeing it. As a matter of fact, a fellow was starting up a magazine out in uh, Los Angeles, and he made up the whole story of this Russian pilot that saw the boat and the regiment of engineers from the Tsars, Russia, that went out and investigated it and all of that. He made this up, you know, just it was a novel. Mm -hmm. Strictly, and we all, uh, our hunters, have letters from him apologizing for that fact. But these things stick in people's minds. Sure. And so uh, when people see this, they say, well, that's not barred shape, so that can't be Noah's Ark. But anyway, we have had some uh, adventures. And mm -hmm. so I guess uh, along those lines, uh, I would prefer being called Tennessee Wyatt rather than Indiana Tennessee, Jones. <laughs> Tennessee Wyatt, okay, Tennessee yeah, Wyatt. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, he was, uh, Ron was on the uh, cover of Nashville Magazine several months ago, and it says, In Search of Noah's Ark. It looks like something out of the uh, Ark of the, uh, what is it, Raiders of the Lost Ark right. movie, and also his book, Discovered. Noah's Ark uh, has kind of that feel to it. Your publishers tend to think that that's, uh, that's kind of who you are. And, uh, well, I don't know. I think, I think you've, uh, you've had some wonderful experiences. And I, I want to talk about the one that I remember. Okay. When I met you eight years ago, we sat and talked about the Ark of the Covenant. Are you a prophet, Ron? Do you... Do you Think of yourself as a, as a prophet. Well, uh, my wife would say, uh, she makes a little joke about this. She says, I've been strictly non-profit ever since she's known me. <laughs> You've been uh, married speaking about, about four the, years. Right, about the yeah. financial <laughs> strain of doing this research. Okay. Uh, uh, seriously, anybody, that, say for example, the weatherman on television, uh, back when they were just talking uh, from the viewpoint of calling these people prophets, they would be a weather prophet. Mm -hmm. So anybody that makes any comments about a future event, by definition, is a prophet. So I would, that would cover everybody. You know, like some ladies say, if you don't do this, that, and the other, I'm going to do such and such. Well, she's a prophetess. <laughs> she's predicting the <laughs> right. future. Right, and whether she actually does it or not uh, tells you whether she was a false prophetess or uh, accurate. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we do deal with things that will have a tremendous impact on the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a close relationship with God because these things... Uh, are objects that he has preserved from each time he intervened into the, uh, shall we say, human history in a supernatural manner. Mm -hmm. You remember he destroyed the earth uh, with the flood because the human race had gotten so wicked mm -hmm. that I suppose they were on the verge of self-destruct. And then later, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they got to be such... Uh, sinful individuals that he burned the city and so we have been able to find and document that and then of course the okay. Red Sea crossing mm -hmm. the storage uh, silos for the grain that Joseph, Joseph. Uh, mm -hmm. collected over the seven years of plenty we are currently working on that how do you find time to do all these finds I mean do you how, well, how often do you get out to these sites I've been to the Middle East uh, over 40 times. Doesn't speak very highly of my efficiency. Uh, but anyway, we uh, work on this. Uh, uh, we sit down, we pray about this, and uh, I try to put myself in the place of the person that's watching mm -hmm. the results of our work. And uh, again, I am a very critical individual and so we try to document it from that point of view so that the person seeing it uh, has uh, every reason to know that these things are facts or they are real objects okay. now I think in archaeology one of my professors told me in the whole class he says you do not excavate a site just to see what's there 
you decide ahead of time what you want to be there and you make it happen. Well, that's is not that science. Cheating? <laughs> that doesn't that, sound that right to me. is pathetic because, you know, the whole object, I would think, of scientific investigation is to find out how things work or what was there. Mm -hmm. But this is what they tell you. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, uh, we try to give folks all of the evidence and I feel that after all the risk and expense uh, and time that I have invested in this, that that gives me the right to give my opinion of what I think the significance of all of this is, but I feel obliged to provide all of the raw data so that other people can review it and think about it, pray about it, and say, well, you Decide know. Decide for themselves. Exactly. Yeah, what they believe. Now, this Ark of the Covenant, that is the, the major, major find. I believe in That's all right. the Bible, that is God's mercy seat that is right. that is God's ark right. and um, you you believe you found it I and do. I know yes. you can't go very far with this conversation because you've been asked not to by uh, the Israel and the people and, I work with in Israel uh, the Middle East has been a very uh, volatile area it doesn't take a lot to get folks killed over there mm -hmm. and so in order to continue my work I have been asked not to discuss uh, any more than we have already shared until we're finished mm -hmm. now at such a time uh, as when we have this finished uh, then we'll be able to show video of all of the objects from Solomon's temple that are not listed in Second Kings, the 25th chapter, and Ezra, the first two chapters. Okay. And uh, also there's some dedicated things. You know, I imagine there's a lot of folks in your audience that would like to see Goliath's sword, for example. Well, you that got was, that? Uh, that was one of the dedicated objects, and it didn't get carried off to Babylon. Uh, uh -huh. And so anyway, there will be, hopefully, by this time next year, people can see all of this for themselves, and they can go if they have the time and money to do so and take a look at the tables of stone that God wrote the Ten Commandments on themselves. Now that it was will be in on the public arc. display. That's, that's correct, yes. Bless your heart. Now I want to, when we, when we met, you told me about taking a little Arab guide into a place that uh, evidently the Lord pointed out to you because you don't really feel like you're just a whole lot smarter than everybody else. I, I know that from you, Ron, and uh, I know that, that you feel that the Lord's just letting you kind of notice stuff. Yes. And, uh, uh, if I were smart, I'd be rich. Uh, okay. you know, uh, I, I am just thrilled uh, out of my skull uh, to be working on these things and some I get asked quite often you know why I think God gave me this privilege and the Bible states very simply that God uses the simple things mm -hmm. and uh, but I can certainly live with the idea of being a simple person to get to do this uh, you know, it's an honor and a privilege. And so I don't, uh, once again, I don't even think of myself. I think of all this stuff. Why should I think of Ron Wyatt? You know, I'm just a, a average individual, uh, and there's nothing special. The only thing special about me is that Christ died for me, and he did that for everybody. But you believe that, uh, now it, it would have been, it would have been pretty wonderful. I mean, it, it would be great if eight different people found eight great finds, God's right. finds. But why did you get picked? And you really believe you are chosen to have found these eight uh, finds. Why would God choose one man to find them? Well, he says there in uh, the verse for the day, he says, this once I will show them that my name is the Lord. Now, down through history, there's been Lord Baal, Lord Vishnu, 
uh, Lord Buddha and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so God says this once I will show them that my name is the Lord. And all of these things that he has preserved and kept hidden away until a point in history when we have uh, satellite relays for our television mm -hmm. uh, broadcasts and the ability to translate into everybody's language. And excavate and right. x-ray and All of these things and, yeah. uh, so that the world can see that he has been there all along and that he is God and has intervened and part of that is just taking some simple individual and showing all of this stuff to them so that anybody that's watching knows for a fact that it wasn't that individual smarts or skills or anything that brought all this about. Mm. I mean, uh, no one human being could possibly do all of this stuff. And the reason I believe it's real is because we have all of it on video and uh, artifacts that, shall we say, are in safekeeping uh, that people can see that prove the point. Okay. We're going to take a break here, and I'm going to take a deep breath. This is exciting for me. I, I love listening about this, and I wish I had uh, been able to stay up three days before we actually got you in here and, and studied all this story over and over again. But uh, we're going to go to a break and come back, and we've got another, oh, forever to go, another hour and 15 minutes. Okay. We'll get into some more. Ron, you were recently held hostage. It was all over the newspaper that you were a hostage over. Was it in Turkey? Uh, yes, it was. And how'd that happen? Well, <clears throat> there's uh, some political problems in Turkey, like there is in you know almost any country in the world. We have been extremely blessed here in America that uh, while there's some political differences, uh, things have not gotten violent. I think we did see a display in Los Angeles that shows it can happen very quickly. But uh, in Turkey, there's a group that would like to uh, take a part of Turkey and turn it into their homeland or whatever. Uh, and these individuals are looking for publicity. Mm -hmm. And taking Western hostages is one of the means that they perceive to be effective in getting attention. And we were out there <clears throat> going to do some work on Noah's Ark. And uh, these people, I am told by the Turkish security people, uh, have sympathizers or cooperators that have access to the computers. For example, you go into any country, they put you on, an, on the computer as a tourist or whatever your status you are. In visiting their country, this helps them keep track of you, keep a record of what's going on. So we were there, and the word got around, and these people uh, set up a roadblock and uh, caught us and took us out in the mountains and, uh, shall we say, wore me out. Uh, I'm 59 years old. I was 58 then, but a year doesn't make that much difference. And we were forced to travel through the mountains as, at the rate of speed that these young gorillas could travel. Now, did they hit and you or do any physical uh, abuse? They didn't do any deliberate physical abuse. Uh, however, they on one occasion dug our grave. And uh, uh, it, there was a lot of psych psychological pressure mm -hmm. on us. And I had an experience there. The Turkish military surrounded uh, the position of these uh, terrorists one uh, night. And the next morning, they uh, challenged these people and told them to uh, let us go and to drop their weapons and surrender. Mm -hmm. And the leader of the terrorist group said, if, uh, if you don't go away, we're going to kill the tourists now. Uh -huh. And they lined up in front of us, and they were going to kill us if there had been one shot fired down below. And I was, uh, you know, I figured that was it. 
one of the terrorists that was standing in front of me had tears running down his face, and he was a tough kid. So I thought, you know, if he was that convinced that probably uh, there wasn't that much time left. So I said a little prayer, you know, as Christians always should do, and just say, Lord, you know, whatever you want that will have a better effect on your work and stuff is fine by me. And, uh, you know, I said, but if it's your will, I'd like to survive this experience. (laughs) Well, the text that came to mind was, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. I'd much rather the one about the angel of the Lord and campeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them came to mind. But it didn't. And so anyway, uh, there was a peace there. You know, God says he'll take care of your children and he'll do all of this. And so, anyway, these people simply wanted attention. And what they were planning to do was take us down to northern Iraq and kill us one at a time. When the publicity died down uh, from one death, then they would kill another one and get more publicity and then kill another one. And the State Department had written us off. Uh, We have copies of the... uh, interdepartmental communications and they had written us off they had word from their sources that that we were not going to be released we were not going to survive and as it worked out while they were transferring us to Iraq northern Iraq I had the opportunity to overpower the driver of the vehicle spin the car out uh, on the shoulder of the road and got us out of the situation but uh, well, you are Indiana Jones after all, or uh, Tennessee Ron, or Tennessee Wyatt. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, there comes a time when if you don't do something, you know the uh, end is obvious. Mm-hmm. And I'm not one to sit idly by and let nasty thing ha- things happen, uh, you know, to myself mm-hmm. or to other people. No. And so this is what it was all about. It, they were seeking publicity. And they got a great deal. As you said, it was all over, you know, the newspapers the and TV papers, and yes. everything. You, uh, uh, are, we have some clips here, and I want to get back oh, okay. into, uh, into some of this that you have found. You, you have discovered what you believe is the uh, right crossing of the Red Sea. Is yes, right? ma'am. And uh, we want to run some of that clip here for a minute. And uh, will you tell us what we're looking at oh, as, sure. yes, uh, as we do to. this? Uh-huh. Uh, the map that we're seeing there, uh, the, the crossing is just to, what, almost center screen, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes. This is a satellite map, and those things are wonderful when it comes to fi- figuring out the terrain and the uh, route of the exodus. Uh, they can also tell where a lot of people okay. have traveled because it compresses the ground, and even though wind blows the sand around, you can still note these on uh, okay. uh And so this is the canyon that Moses led, and I'll use a term here that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it's the Habiru. And this is a collection of Semitic slaves that were in Egypt uh, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were enslaved by the founder of the 18th dynasty, which is Thutmose I. And anyway... God destroyed the Egyptians, as you are familiar with, at the crossing site. This is the beach they came out on to the near side towards uh, us. There's a large Egyptian fortress that has been there uh, all the way back to that point in time and before. So they. How big is that? Is that uh, big enough to hold uh, uh, Israel? It, it is. There's about seven to 8,000 uh, acres. Oh, there, okay. and uh, so anyway, that could hold four million people that easily. came out on in the Exodus. Now, what are we seeing here? Uh, well, we're looking uh, down towards the south. Josephus, uh, those that like to check references on these things, in his Antiquities of the Jews tells about this, and they went down towards the south, but some mountains come right out into the water and cut off any movement in that direction. And that's so, what he talked about, was right. the mountain coming down to the water. He did. And then Pharaoh came out uh-huh. and uh, just sealed them off between the mountains and the sea and the Egyptian army. Now, this uh, is a Phoenician-style column 
uh, set up by King Solomon. There's an inscription on the one uh, on the opposite shore in Saudi Arabia uh, that says that this is where God opened the sea and drowned Mizraim, which was their uh, term for Egypt, and uh, delivered the uh, Israelites and the mixed multitude. Okay. Uh, I believe this, this is, is an underwater. I've, I believe you said this was uh, uh, right human. to the top left of the screen uh, is a human rib cage, and there are some other bones there, like the cervical vertebrae of the uh, spine and the back of the skull that mm -hmm. uh, are visible in this photograph. And our little lionfish uh, is there to show people that we, you know, this is not a gimmick. This mm -hmm. is 80 feet under the water. Now, this shows uh, a chariot wheel uh, at about 80 feet, about the same depth. Mm -hmm. uh, are there many underwater. of these out there? There are just, there's approximately 20,000 chariots that got wiped out in this experience. So the bottom is littered okay. with the chariots, uh, parts, and people's remains and horses skeletons and uh, we've collected a couple of horses hoofs from out there. I was rather surprised that they survived, but they did. Well, I guess the Lord could make them survive if he wanted to uh, have you find them here years yes. later. And I remember one of the first uh, things that I saw was an underwater, somebody you had had a, an underwater film uh, of this and swimming through and you could see these artifacts uh -huh. and uh, it just drop me in my tracks to yes. see these chariots under there. Do they recognize it over there now? Uh, uh, yes, the director of antiquities. I took one of the chariot hubs in to have it identified and to, uh, uh, you know, discuss what, uh, how we should proceed with this. And uh, the gentleman, Nasif Muhammad Hassan, looked at it. He said, that's 18th Dynasty chariot. Okay, uh, is this the right time? Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, now, he uh, well, had me at a disadvantage. I, at that point in time, I was unaware that the only time in Egyptian history that they experimented with eight-spoke chariot wheels was during the 18th dynasty. And this was an eight-spoke chariot wheel. So to him, it was very simple to identify it. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I thought, well, you know, he didn't take a very close look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm inclined mm -hmm. to, you know, really look things over and poke at them and whatnot, and make sure what they are. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have to because he was aware of something I was unaware of at that point in time. Okay. Talk to me about this crossing. Uh, who decided, whoever decided where the crossing was? I mean, the original, the traditional site that they think where they uh, really crossed. Uh, Susan Constantine's mother, uh, she's known as St. Helena. Uh, at that point in time, she was known as Empress Helena. Mm -hmm. uh, went to the Holy Land, spent uh, uh, roughly six months, and she just went around and said, this is where this happened, and that's where that happened. And they uh, built little shrines in all these areas. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the lady was supposed to claim to have been divinely guided but in archaeological research since that time, there has not been one single site that she pointed out that has any physical remains, uh, and there's good evidence that none of them are accurate. Okay. Uh, but the uh, traditional Mount Sinai, St. Katerina, uh, or Jabal Musa, in the Sinai Peninsula uh, indicated that uh, the crossing was at the Gulf of Suez or up by the Bittern Lakes. Now, the Bible talks about the Yom Suf, you know, in the Hebrew uh, there, which means Sea of Reeds. That's one of the translations mm -hmm. of it. Well, at this crossing site over on the Gulf of Aqaba, there is a tremendous amount of vegetation uh, at this area. In fact, uh, the bottom is so covered with uh, reeds, underwater reeds and stuff, except for, uh, say, December and January, that it's very difficult to do much research other than during those two months. Okay. Uh, so anyway, God has allowed people to think uh, other places were the sites uh, and preserve these, like I mentioned a minute ago, for a time when he can show the whole world 
where it actually is. Oh. And, you know, people are pack rats. If we had known where all these things were all these years, there'd have been nothing left no, for us. They would today. have taken it home, stuck it in a glass case. Right. <laughs> We're going to take a break right here, right. and I want to come back and talk about where they went when they crossed through the Red Sea. Okay. And uh, they actually were going to Mount Sinai. Yes. And uh, we'll be right back with that. Mm -hmm. 